Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of the Social Security Committee in 2018. I can remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent modes so they do not disrupt the meeting or the broadcasting. No apologies have been received for today's meeting. Um, agenda item one, the only agenda item today is consideration of Social Security Bill at stage two. We will continue where we left off last week and we will not continue beyond the end of part two, chapter two today. There are 17 groups of amendments to the end of part two and it may well be that we don't get through them all this morning, but we will endeavour to do our best. Um, can I once again welcome uh, the Minister and accompanying officials to committee this morning and we'll now proceed directly to um, where we left off last week. So um, I call amendment 143 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated last week with Amendment 141, and ask um, Ms McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. Now call Amendment 144 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 141, and ask Ms McNeill to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. Uh, and we now uh, move to the first grouping today, which is on consultation on Charter. And um, I call the amendment 145 in the name of Jeremy for Balfour, grouped with the amendments 103, 104, 105, 12, 13, 106 and 107. And ask Mr Balfour to move the amendment 145 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Camina, and, and, and good morning. Uh, amendment 145 is a fairly straightforward amendment and I'm sure that this government uh, will do what is requested within it without it being there. But I am concerned that we are looking forward to a number of years to future governments and uh, future MSPs who may not have had the benefit of sitting around uh, this table. And I think it is important that those with mental disability are consulted appropriately um, when any changes and any consultations are going on. Um, I appreciate again that the government has done this um, leading up to where we are to today, but we are future looking at this bill. For over 30, about 33% of people who um, are in receipt of DLA or PIP have um, a mental disability. And previous um, generations in, in previous stages perhaps they have felt excluded in regard to consultation. And the movement of this amendment is there to uh, just to remind uh, government, to remind parliament that when consultation takes place, it's not just those with physical disability that should be consulted, but it's those with mental disability um, as well. Um, I will leave it there at this, this stage. Thank you, Camino. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Could you formally move the amendment? Formally move it. Thank you. Um, I invite Mark Griffin to speak to Amendment 103 and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, amendments 103, 105, um, 106 um, are, are um, equalities related amendments, and 108 that we'll come to later in the group are all to ensure that. Um, equality is embedded on the face of the legislation and therefore in the social security system itself and I, I welcome the, the government's um, notice that they will be uh, supporting these amendments. They're also supported by Engender, Scottish Women's Aid and the Coalition for Racial Equality um, and Rights. And we know that in many equalities groups, uh, in particular women, BME groups and disabled people have higher rates of poverty and therefore may depend on the, the social security system more, and that is the reason why I've lodged um, these amendments. And we know that equalities groups experience um, equality in different ways, and that the barriers and disadvantages um, experienced by these groups may not be known from the office, especially when, um, especially when there's a, a lack of data available, which is the motivation behind Amendment 1108. Uh, which we'll come to later. That's uh, why I think it's important that ongoing engagement with these groups be required. Um, there shouldn't be any groups that we um, deem um, hard to reach by the Scottish social security system, and we should take extra care to make sure that um, all those groups, especially most disadvantaged, 
are involved and included, and that is those are the reason behind lodging um, 103, 5, 6 and 7. On amendment um, 104, um, that is part of a, a package of amendments related um, to the Give Me Five uh, top-up child benefit um, proposal um, that will come to the, uh, at a later stage. Uh, this would mean consulting with all parents and um, I think that even though the argument is, is or, or can be made that child benefit is a reserved benefit, that consulting um, with that group would still have particular value since the Scottish Government has the power to top up that um, particular benefit and that, that would be uh, worthwhile covering um, in the bill too. So thank you, Camira. Thank you. Um, can I invite the Minister to speak to Amendment 12 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you, Convener, and good morning to colleagues. Um, let me start with Amendment 145 um, in the name of Mr Balfour. Implicit in that amendment, in my view, is a very important point that those in receipt of disability assistance are a diverse group, including people with both physical and mental uh, conditions. But these groups have different needs, and I do agree that it is crucial that the views of both are fairly represented in the Charter co-design process. However, I hope to persuade Mr Balfour and the committee that we have in place robust plans to deliver the nuanced engagement he seeks. The recently published experience panels about you research found that 39% of respondents with a disability had a mental health condition, 50% uh, with a physical disability or condition. Additionally, we are developing plans to supplement experience panels with ways of engaging seldom heard groups who may not be so comfortable engaging in focus group style activity and are working with particular stakeholders to ensure that we uh, have additional involvement in areas of particular interest. As part of the Charter co-design, we are also looking to work with key stakeholders to facilitate engagement with the people they represent, including organisations that support those both with physical and with mental health conditions. I would also make the point that the amendment, in my view, is to an extent prescriptive in that it requires ministers to focus on a particular split, a representative portion. I do think this could produce unintended results that I'm sure none of us would want. And the question has to arise whether it is more important to achieve the perfect proportional split with a small number or more important to engage with larger numbers of both groups, even if the split isn't the right proportion. So I would invite Mr Balfour not to move Amendment 145 on the basis that we are already thinking carefully about these issues. Um, I'm pleased to support Amendments 103, 105, 106 and 107 in the name of Mr Griffin. Uh, these reflect what the Scottish Government already intends in relation to the consultation on the Charter and there is benefit in codifying these requirements in the Bill, especially in relation to future reviews of the Charter. There may be some minor adjustment that we will want to bring to the wording at Stage 3, but I am happy to support these amendments. I cannot, however, support Amendment 104, as there is no reason to consult anyone in receipt of benefits the Scottish Secu Social Security System won't be delivering when it comes to our Charter. Equally, there would be no reason to choose just one of the many benefits that remain reserved to the UK Government as the Charter does not relate to them. For example, universal credit, income support, child tax credits, maternity pay or pension credit. These are all for the UK Government to deliver and be responsible for. My Amendment 12 is a technical amendment that I hope the Committee will find easy to support. As the Committee is aware, the Scottish Government has committed to co-designing the Charter in partnership with those who have direct experience of the system. That work will be underway before this Bill has passed and received Royal Assent. Amendment 12 simply ensures that all of the consultation work uh, counts towards fulfilling the consultation duty. My other amendment in this group, Amendment 13, is rooted in my conversations with Professor Sally Witcher and Bill Scott of Inclusion Scotland. They are strong advocates of the rights-based nature of the system we propose and the Charter that will give practical effect to that approach. Their concern is that if a future government does not share that commitment, it may seek to use the powers excuse me, in Section 5 for ministers to review this, the Charter to substantially dilute it. 
as a safeguard against that. Amendment 13 will require ministers consult with the Commission on Social Security when reviewing the Charter. And indeed, as a further safeguard, as I said last week, uh, when discussing uh, amendments on Charter approval, I will be happy to work with Ms McNeill in ensuring that the Scottish Parliament has a role in scrutinising any changes to the Charter. Uh, I am pleased to move the amendments in my name. Thank you. Fully uh, completes her statement. I wonder if um, we could expand on the reasoning um, on Amendment 12, um, just a, a concern um, that the amendment states that it is immaterial that anything done by way of consultation done before this bill or for this act to be passed. I concern that this would rule out um, any evidence gathered by the experienced panels. So just a few will tell you those concerns. What, what Amendment 12 seeks to do is to ensure that in advance of uh, the preparation and the conclusion of the work on the Charter, that the consultation work that has been undertaken to date and will continue on the illustrative regulations uh, around the benefits we intend to deliver in Wave 1 is consultation that can count towards our requirement to consult. And I think, I think Mr Griffin, uh, as I was myself when he first raised it with me, is a bit thrown by the word immaterial, um, because it sounds like it doesn't count. Um, and actually, I'm advised in, in, lawyer, in the lawyer's world, it does. <laughs> what can we say? Perhaps Mr Tompkins can help us out. I think your interpretation is correct. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, could, uh, does anyone else wish to speak in this grouping? No, um, can I therefore move to Mr Balfour to press or withdraw his amendment? Yeah, I'm going to press my amendment to uh, Convener for uh, Amendment 145. One, I mean, I think um, I hear what the Minister is saying and I um, take her, her mm -hmm. word uh, very seriously, but I do think it still is important to have within this bill and then act uh, a, a clear uh, duty that those that have mental disability uh, will be consulted in an appropriate way. Um, I know Sam Aitch and other groups are, are keen to see this. Uh, they're keen to have um, that, that backstop um, in case there is any change uh, within government or, or in, in regard to policy. Um, we will be supporting the Minister's um, amendments and also supporting Mark Griffin's um, amendments as well. Um, the question is that Amendment 145 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, we move to uh, division. Um, the question is that Amendment 145 be agreed. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against? Abstention, sorry. Just, really voted. Um, the results of the decision are five votes for. Four votes again, therefore the amendment is agreed. We now move to call amendment 103 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 145, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 103 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Thank you. Call amendment 104 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 145. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, we are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Um, can I ask um, those in favour of Amendment 104 to please raise their hands? Those against? Uh, the result of the division are five votes for, four votes again. The uh, amendment is therefore agreed. So I now call amendment 105 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 145, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that amendment 105 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 145, and ask the Minister to move formally. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, thank you. Uh, the question is that Section 
three be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 146 in the name of Pauline McNeill, already debated with Amendment 141, and ask Pauline McNeill to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Um, the next question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 145, and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 106 in the name of Mark Griffin, already be debated with Amendment 145, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 106 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 107 in the name of Mark Griffin, already, <coughs> already debated with Amendment 145, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 107 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 147 in the name of Polly McNeill, already debated with Amendment 141, and ask Polly McNeill to move or not, not move. Thank you. Um, the question is that Section 5 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Now move to um, next. Uh, Grouping, which is the effect of charter. Um, I call amendment 61 in the name of Adam Tompkins, group with amendments 18, 18A and 50, and ask Mr Tompkins to move amendment 61 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, convener. I move amendment 61 in my name. Um, we had a debate uh, last week about a similar provision on the effect of the principles, and I don't want to reheat or repeat that debate. Uh, but during that debate, both Mr McPherson and the Minister were kind enough to indicate that they would support Amendment um, 61. The purpose of Amendment 61 is to clarify what we as the uh, Parliament intends the effect of the Charter to be, to avoid unnecessary and potentially very expensive litigation um, to resolve uh, that issue. Um, the wording uh, is um, similar to wording which already appears elsewhere in the Scottish uh, statute book. Um, and that's all I really want to say about Amendment 61 at the moment. Um, uh, amendment 18A, which is also in my name, uh, convener, is an amendment to the Minister's Amendment 18. Um, I, I hope that the Minister is not going to press that amendment, and if she doesn't press that amendment, then I obviously won't press Amendment 18A, because it would be redundant. Um, I, I think that both Amendment 18 and Amendment 18A are now redundant, given the evidence that this committee obtained, I think, a fortnight ago from the um, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman in terms of the jurisdiction that the Ombudsman already has uh, under her empowering legislation um, to investigate complaints um, of injustice arising out of maladministration with regard to the Scottish Social Security Agency because of the way in which the agency is to be um, uh, uh, created as an arm of the Scottish Government. So um, I uh, hope that the Minister agrees, agrees with me that Amendment 18 is now unnecessary um, uh, and, uh, and will not be uh, pressed. Thank you. Um, could I invite the Minister to speak to Amendment 18 and the other amendments in the group? Thank you very much. Um, can I start by saying that, uh, as I indicated, I am pleased to support Amendment 61 in Mr Tomkins' name. Um, can I also draw the committee's attention? I think it will be helpful to our consultation on draft tribunal rules, uh, which we launched on the 22nd of January, which also proposes that tribunals must have regard to the Social Security Charter when considering appeals for devolved Social Security assistance. I think an important complement to what this amendment will say. I don't intend to uh, rehearse the arguments that we had uh, a week ago. I agree with Mr. Uh, Tomkins, that uh, it is clear from the evidence that uh, we have received, that you've received and I have heard from both uh, Dr McCormick and uh, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, uh, the role that uh, the Ombudsman's Office will play. And for that reason, I don't intend to move either Amendment 18 or 50. Um, and with that, I think, convener, I'm concluded. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to come in? Thank you. Um, I invite Mr Tompkins to wind up or press or withdraw Amendment 61. Nothing further to say, Camina. I, I press the amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 61 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, we now move to um, another group, um, Right to Social Security. 
And I would call Amendment 116 in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendment 117. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, amendment 116 and 117, I feel advanced the Scottish Government's objective to ensure Scotland's social security system is world leading in taking a human rights based approach to social security. The Scottish Government's response to the Social Security Committee's Stage 1 report acknowledges that Scottish Ministers have a duty to comply with human rights treaties such as the ICESCR. Yet the Bill does not currently place any duty on them to comply with the right to Social Security as defined in international human rights law or to have regard to it. The Scottish Government's response also acknowledges that international human rights are substantive and real and reaffirmed their commitment to give an effect to those rights. I think it's important to be clear that the human right to Social Security is not principally protected by ECHR. Full compliance with the ECHR will not on its own deliver protection of the right to Social Security. Um, the right to Social Security is found in a number of international human rights instruments, most notably in Article 9 of ICESCR. The, the detail of the right to Social Security is provided in um, General Comment 19 from 2007. That uh, comment provides that Social Security must be available, adequate and accessible and addresses issues of coverage, eligibility, participation and information and, and physical access. Amendments 116 and 117 um, and obliging Scottish ministers and public authorities, um, in particular the, the agency, to have due regard to the right to Social Security would ensure that the content of the, the rights features as a driver for good policy and decision making, building a system based on, on human rights. And the amendments also introduce a, a vital means of holding the Scottish ministers and the agency to account for their decision-making processes. I think there is a uh, precedent uh, where there are other uh, pieces of legislation where this has um, been embedded, the Community Empowerment Act, the Land Reform Act, Children and Young Peoples Act. Um, and only uh, last week at Portfolio Questions, uh, the Cabinet Secretary said it is imperative that we acknowledge that the UK Government's proposals to repeal the 1998 Act or even to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights put at risk the most vulnerable members of society and hit them the hardest. The Scottish Government is committed to defending the existing human rights um, and to embedding human rights, equality and respect in everything that we do so that everyone in Scotland to, can live a life of human dignity. For me, um, Amendments 116 and 117 um, simply put that, that aspiration into legislation and I would ask uh, committee members to support and I move Amendment 116. Thank you, Mr Griffin. Um, uh, do any other members wish to come in, Mr McPherson? Uh, th thank you very much, Convener. I think this is an extremely important set of amendments to, to con well, the issue, the overarching issue is an extremely important one to consider given the time that we uh, discussed it during the stage one proceedings. I think there are a number of questions that, that need to be asked, though, around being prescriptive in this way around specific pieces of international law, given that there's already an uh, overriding commitment within the principles to human rights and that ministers are expected to uphold international law and uh, the courts to take, out of, uh, take account of treaties when it comes to domestic legislation in the round. So I have a, a number of questions on this to, to, to try and understand more specifically what advantage this would bring and to determine whether it would actually be counterproductive and create vulnerability for judicial review and other uh, consequences around uh, suppressing the operation of the system. So uh, Mark, I just want, Mr Griffin, I wondered if you could uh, elaborate on the intention behind your amendments, given that they only mention the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Is, it, is the suggestion within that 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 treaty should be looked at to the exclusion of others, or that it should be given higher status over others? Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to understand if you think that covenant is more important than, say, the, the European Social Charter. 
And uh, why do the amendments require judicial consideration of the views of the UN's Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, but not the opinions of, say, the Council of Europe's European Committee on, on Social Rights? Uh, another uh, question relate to, do you think that the Covenant on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights provides enough detail to make it legally applicable? Has it been considered that its vagueness leads to successful judicial review and then regulations being void and people not being paid? Uh, human rights are interrelated and indivisible. Is it a good idea to take a piecemeal bill-by-bill bill approach, as I said? Would it not be better to, as the Cabinet Secretary, which you quoted, quoted said, that human rights should apply to everything we do? Do, do we not need to take a more Scotland-wide approach on this? Um, given that the, the First Minister's advisory group on human rights is looking how best to reflect human rights instruments in domestic legislation across the spectrum. Uh, would these amendments cut across that work? And also, I think it's important to recognise that UN committees aren't, aren't elected, uh, so there's a, there's a democratic question or, uh, before we enshrine that into primary legislation. Just finally, convener, I think that you know, ministers are already held to account in any circumstances where they fall short of treaty obligations under international law. Uh, social security as a human right is a founding ideal of the system already in the principles. And the Charter will explain in detail the actions and standards required to realise that in practice the Commission will have the ability to independently review performance. So I think we really need to think carefully about being as prescriptive as these amendments undertake and question whether a better approach would be to look at human rights being part of the overarching nature of the bill as they already are in the principles and that uh, being careful not to give precedence or preference to certain bits of international law when a more comprehensive and overarching consideration of international law may be more effective. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tompkins, would you like? Uh, thank you, Kavina. I think um, Mr. McPherson asks a whole series of, of quite important questions about these uh, um, significant uh, amendments. Um, uh, if I could, uh, the one I would pick out as the most important of all of that um, uh, kind of suite of questions, which um, Mrs. McPherson has rather thrown at you, Mr. Griffin, is, is this. The, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is not judicially enforced. It is, in, it is, it is policed, it is monitored, by an international committee of unelected um, UN e experts. It's not judicially enforced. And uh, these amendments require the judicial recognition in Scottish courts and tribunals of opinions and reports of that uh, committee. Now, what we have tried to do with regard to the principles and with regard to the charter um, is to clarify rather than to make more murky uh, the legal status of the principles in the Charter. And it seems to me that there's a risk, an unintended, no doubt, risk in these amendments, that by um, requiring courts and tribunals in Scotland to have judicial cognizance of what are non-judicial um, uh, reports and opinions coming from the committee that polices at UN level the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, we blur that distinction between um, you know, where th there is going to be a right to social security which is judicially enforceable and where there is going to be a right to social security which is going to be something which ministers and indeed MSPs have to bear in mind as they uh, make and implement regulations. Um, and I'm sure that's not an intended consequence of these uh, amendments, which I'm sure are well-intentioned, but I think it is nonetheless a significant um, demerit um, in, um, in the way in which these amendments have been uh, drafted. That's not to say that the other issues that Mr. McPherson put to you are unimportant, but I think that's probably the, the most significant one for me. Okay, uh, Mr. Adam. Yes, uh, thank you, Kavina. I think uh, what I'd like to agree with Mr. Tompkins and uh, Ben McPherson. We, uh, from the point of views with Ben in particular, is social security, the, the Cabinet Secretary has always said from the starting point, as a human right, is a founding principle of what we're trying to do here. Or oh, sorry, the Minister said. But uh, and the Charter does explain the actions and standards required for that. But the problem I have with Mr Griffin, this is purely me. You know, obviously, from the backgrounds of Mr McPherson and Mr Tompkins, they're coming from a, a legal perspective. But I think I know what you're trying to do. But I I'm a bit confused as to whether you're actually going to be able to do what you're trying to do with everything you've put down. Now, if I'm confused, 
then my concern is the minute the lawyers get their hands on that, then because uh, you could end up with a murky mess. So uh, I understand where he, uh, Mr Griffin's coming from, but I'm a, uh, it's a bit confusing, and uh, that gives me some concerns. It may be just me, though, convener. It has been happened before that I have been confused. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't like to comment, Mr Adam. Uh, can I invite no other members have indicated they want to come in, so I invite the Minister. Thank you very much. And let, let me start by saying, uh, again, that the government is serious about human rights and following through on our treaty obligations. As others have said, the ministerial code, the Scottish ministerial code, states very clearly that every minister has an overarching duty to uphold the law, including international law and treaty obligations in everything we do. To ensure that that happens in the new system, Amendment 118 in my name will enable the independent Scottish Commission on Social Security in performing any of its functions to have regard to international law standards. That is a conscious and deliberate inclusion on our part. More than that, the Commission will, re will require to have regard to any relevant international human rights instruments when considering proposed regulations. That means that when considering any reforms, the government, this parliament, or indeed the public, will always be able to have the benefit of independent expert opinion on how any proposals measure up against treaty obligations. That input from experts who have specialist knowledge of social security will be invaluable because international treaties are necessarily expressed in general and high level terms. The commission will have the skill set to translate that, to translate what the treaties require into a Scottish context. And should it appear that the new system is falling short of any of those requirements in any respect, it will be for the Parliament and Government to do something about it. In this way, the Bill will make sure that respect for international obligations is built into the system from the start in a way that ensures the system gives, gives practical and meaningful effect to people's rights. The Bill achieves this in other ways too. The principles establish human rights as a founding ideal of the system. Principle B, in fact, goes further than the key provision of the instrument that establishes social security as a human right. Through the Charter, those ideals will be carried from the statute book into the everyday delivery of services. The Charter will be co-produced with the benefit of input from the Ombudsman's Office, and as we agreed last week, will be subject to agreement by the Parliament through the amendment we will work with Ms. McNeill to bring forward at stage three. Additionally, the Charter will have the benefit of the clarity that Mr. Tompkins amendment that has, uh, we've just discussed uh, brings to it. There are numerous examples already of uh, the co-productive nature of our approach. Examples from the experience panels, the design of process of information, the choice options in our universal credit Scottish choices. Examples that barely scratch the surface, but I do think they are indicative of an approach that will consider every detail and leave nothing uh, undone which uh, is needed to fulfil people's rights. Now, Mr Griffin's two amendments to this group represent, I think, a different approach, and I cannot support them. Rather than involving subject experts in designing the system so that compliance with international standards is embedded from the start, his amendments would leave it to the general courts to evaluate the system once it's in operation. Last week, Mr Griffin very helpfully did not press his Amendment 138 because of what we discussed as unintended consequences and the risk it posed for people's income. Those risks are the same posed by his amendments today. His amendments open the door to the court striking down the regulations, which will provide the whole basis on which people will be given assistance. Should a court uphold a challenge, ministers would be required to stop applying the area challenged, stop paying the assistance, unless ministers could convince a court to suspend its decision pending an appeal. Even if a challenge ultimately failed, and since the system is designed to ensure compliance with treaty obligations, these challenges should fail, the very fact a case is taken and the steps in the process I have touched on are gone through, all of that will cause significant uncertainty for people and will inevitably divert money away from the people the social security system should be helping and instead put it into legal fees and court costs. To expose this new system, but more importantly, 
those who rely on it for support for these risks is, I believe, unwarranted. These proposals were not mentioned, far less supported in the committee's stage one report. The committee has heard no evidence on the consequences, unintended or otherwise, of taking this unprecedented approach from legal academics, the law society, the faculty of advocates or the judiciary. I'm sure that all of us here value uh, Scotland's record on human rights. The Scottish Government certainly does, and that is exactly why the First Minister has established an expert group under the, the leadership of Professor Alan Miller to look holistically at what more can be done to embed the protection of internationally recognised rights in Scotland. I think that is the proper place for that discussion to be held, for that group of experts, considering international evidence and expertise, to then recommend an overarching Scotland-wide approach on how we can protect, enhance and embed human rights across all of this Parliament's legislation. As a responsible Parliament, we should be seeing the work of that group and taking time to consider their recommendations based on a robust and considered evidence base, allowing the whole Parliament the opportunity to fully discuss these issues on a properly informed basis and consider what is the right approach for Scotland going forward. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 116? Thank you, Camilla. The Scottish Government response to the Stage 1 report acknowledges Ministers have a duty to comply with human rights treaties such as ICESCR, but the Bill doesn't currently place any duty on them to comply with the right to Social Security as defined in international human rights law or to have regard to it. The reason these amendments um, linked to those particular pieces of um, UN um, articles is simply that that is the, the evidence the committee received um, during their stage one process and the evidence that the committee subsequently uh, received in, in briefings from um, outside organisations such as um, forget, the Scottish Human Rights um, Commission. There are examples, well, I would take the argument that we should look at a Scotland-wide holistic approach. There are examples where this has been um, used already. I mentioned the Community Empowerment Act, the Land Reform Act, and the Children and Young um, People Act. I take on board what the government is saying on whether a potential court action could then uh, strike down regulations and, and potentially lead to um, claimants not receiving um, their, their payments, but the, the risk the, the government referred to demonstrates just how important it would be for the government to discharge their duty properly in the first place. Um, I think if the government was in any doubt that their actions would breach human rights, then they would seriously consider the credibility um, of that course of action. Um, on justiciability, I think judges have dealt um, ably with questions um, of rights, for example, of what constitutes torture, what a fair trial means, or what is um, unlawful interference um, with privacy. Um, giving meaning to concepts found in legislation is a clear function of the judiciary, um, not just in human rights, but in any area of um, law. Um, Realisation um, of rights depends on government policy, and it's right that it's a matter for Parliament to put that policy into law, um, but review of government policy to ensure that they are consistent with constitutional principles and obligations under human rights law is clearly a function of the judiciary. This is review, not policy making, and I think the courts are well aware of their, their function in that regard. Um, I, mean, I think judicial enforcement of human rights is fundamental. A right without a remedy questions whether it is in fact a right at all, and for that reason I'll be pressing uh, the amendments in this group. Thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 116 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Uh, it will be a division. The question is that Amendment 116 is agreed. Those in favour, please raise your hand. Those against? Uh, the result of the division are three votes for, 
Six votes again, therefore the amendment is not agreed. Um, I call Amendment 117 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 116, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 4, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. We now move to a new grouping, uh, Annual Report and Other Accountability Mechanisms. I call Amendment 62 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with Amendment 79, 108, 148 and 80. And I invite Mr Balfour to move Amendment 62 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, <clears throat> I think it is a welcome um, move in this bill that there will be an annual report and that that report will outline um, what has happened. And I think it is important that those who are looking at them, who have expectations about how the system will be taken forward, are simply reported in this report. So I think it's a fairly um, benign amendment, but I think it is important, again, just to have it within the legislation to say that this report must meet the expectations. And, um, and I think it's just, again, given clarity um, <clears throat> to what I'm sure will already happen. But again, we have to remember that we are looking ahead into the future. And again, I hope uh, the, the government can accept this. So I move uh, Amendment 62. Thank you. I um, can I invite Mr Griffin to speak to Amendment 79 and to the other amendments in the group. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, um, amendment 79 um, is where um, we're keen to have a debate about how um, we use these powers to, to tackle disability poverty. 42% um, of people in poverty in a household are, have at least one disabled person. And I know we've had earlier debates about um, the, the, the benefits in this group not being income replacement benefits. But what they, are, what they do is to overcome the additional costs that someone with a dis disability lives with, which could push that person into poverty. It could present a barrier to employment, which again could push that person into poverty. Um, these, um, this uh, Amendment 79 supported by uh, Disability Agenda Scotland, Camp Hill Scotland, the Carers Trust, Alliance, um, Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance and uh, Leonard Cheshire. Um, we feel that the, I feel there's a, a precedent with the Child Poverty Act uh, which includes a, a number of explicit targets and the implementation of the socio-economic uh, duty. I think any reform of the social security system in Scotland should address the, the failure of the benefit system to adequately compensate disabled people for those extra costs they face to live an independent life. Um, that is one of the, the several reasons that there are higher rates of poverty amongst disabled people. Those costs associated with disability average around um, £550 per month. Um, and this amendment would require the government to assess the levels of poverty in households with a disabled person or persons and taking into account the added cost of having a disability and work to reduce that rate of, of poverty. Um, 108, um, I'd already touched in an earlier debate about how we um, make sure that those with uh, protected characteristics are, are covered from the outset, that that is in legislation, um, and uh, have that additional um, protection. Um, on 148, um, the Social Security Charter is not intended to confer um, rights on individuals, and it will be the, the agency evaluating and reporting on its own performance. It will be the agency itself that determines the form and content of customer satisfaction surveys, and it is known that um, the agency could then start focusing on it, its own performance targets. This Amendment 148 would help to ensure that uh, the principles have teeth in making the agency and ministers more accountable, accountable to Parliament and those people who depend on the assistance provided and the, the wider Scottish public and could also assist in identifying 
unmet need and um, again contribute to continuous um, improvement. improvement. On Amendment um, 80, um, this amendment is supported by Disability Agenda Scotland, Camphill Scotland, Carers Trust Alliance, Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance and Leonard um, Cheshire. The Social Security Commission um, isn't uh, truly independent from the Act, which is what we are um, seeking a, a, review, a review of um, along with the, the Act on on the whole, the, the bill doesn't place any similar duties on, on ministers to keep the new system, um, just the charter. Um, it doesn't place any duty to keep the, the, the social security system and the legislation itself um, under a review. Um, we feel that review would offer an opportunity to identify any areas in the legislation where changes are necessary, and um, that the review should consider the extent to which the levels uh, types of and types of support available under the system have met and are meeting the needs of those requiring support. And I'd ask um, committee members to support the um, amendments in my name and this group. Thank you. Do any members wish to come in? Um, Ms. McGuire. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm a bit concerned with Amendment 79. Um, disability benefits are not income replacement benefits, they're an acknowledgement of the additional cost um, that people with disabilities incur. Um, so they're not means tested, they're not, they're not taxed. I'm, I'm really concerned that this um, amendment undermines that principle that all people living with a disability incur additional costs and this is, you know, that is what they're, they're for, it's addressing that, it's not an income replacement. Okay, um, Mr Adam. And Fina, just on the positive side, I think I'll be supporting 108 so that Mark doesn't feel as if I'm being negative about absolutely everything he puts forward here today. But the other point is that I agree with my colleague, uh, Ruth Maguire. We're in awkward territory at this point when we start talking about uh, Amendment 79, where we're uh, talking about the benefits, actually. We're almost in the idea of uh, they're, they're not income-based at the moment. They're basically there to support people, as Ruth's already said, in difficult times and the, the extra costs involved in their disability. And I, I, I think we're setting an a unusual or difficult precedent. I, for one, couldn't possibly go back to some of the disabled groups in my constituency and say I'd voted for that. So uh, I, I really think it's a point of principle uh, on that one. But on 108, I'm with them. Thank you. Uh, Mr McPherson? Yeah. Thanks, Convener. Just uh, on 80, I have some concerns around the fact that this Parliament has a role in reviewing legislation through relevant committees. For example, of course, the, the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee. So I think there's a function there for, for Parliament. And uh, the, the amendment as drafted is seeking a review of an act, of this act, if, if passed, uh, which I'm sure, of course, it will be uh, within months of the final parts of social security in Scotland being delivered. That seems premature, in my view. Okay. Um, I invite the minister to respond to the group. Thank you, convener. Let me start uh, by saying that I am happy to support Amendment 108 in the name of Mr. Griffin. Uh, however, other amendments in the group are more problematic, in my view. I would urge the committee not to uh, support Amendment 62 in the name of Mr Balfour. As we discussed last week in the context of Mr Balfour's Amendment 60, the Scottish Ministers and the Social Security Agency are legally the same person. There is therefore no need to have a separate reporting requirements for the agency because the reporting <coughs> duty on ministers will cover everything done by ministers in the guise of the agency. In fact, the agency cannot competently be the subject of separate reporting requirements because it will not have its own separate legal personality. Uh, whilst I share uh, the commitment to reducing poverty, I cannot support Amendment 79. Others have made this point, but disability benefits are not income place replacement benefits, and they're deliberately not means tested or related to income or poverty levels. They're not taxed for this reason, uh, nor do they reduce uh, other benefits. 
Um, the, the point uh, about this is that the amendment that Mr Griffin wants to propose is an amendment that um, misunderstands what these disability benefits are for. Uh, I've already supported Amendment 1 in the name of Alison Johnson, which has placed in the bill a principle on the reduction of poverty for uh, all people, and that would be uh, what I think is the right approach that we should take. There is little about the sentiment in Amendment 148 in the name of Mr Griffin that I disagree with. Uh, Co-design is the centrepiece of the Scottish approach to social security, and it's therefore entirely right we should think about ways to ensure that the voice of people relying on the system continues to be heard in the long term. The problem I have with this amendment, though, is that I think it is simply bad law. It is overly prescriptive. It seeks to codify not just precisely what information should be collected, but the means through which it should be collected, and I don't believe that is helpful. Uh, as our approach to consultation and experience panels has demonstrated, there is a space where innovation is possible and desirable. The right people to inform us about that are the many professional researchers we have working on this project in partnership with our stakeholders, with our experience panels and with the people of Scotland. What the legislation should provide is what is already there, a fundamental principle that this system is built with the people of Scotland on the basis of evidence. That will carry through to commitments in the Charter, the associated reporting duties and ministers will be held accountable for, uh, to robustly, I would imagine, for delivery. So I can't support that amendment and invite the committee to reject it. And finally, whilst I understand the thought behind Amendment 80, again lodged by Mr Griffin, I do not think it is necessary and I also think it intrudes into what is properly the role of this Parliament. Um, the Scottish Government's amendments uh, have uh, set up or intend to set up the Scottish Commission on Social Security and by definition already establish an independent body that would be required to report on any matter that ministers or the parliament ask to re it to report on. In addition, Mr Griffin's amendment requires a, a review three years after royal assent of this bill. By my calculation, that is 2021. That is the point where the full uh, devolution of all the benefits uh, will uh, have taken place, but one could hardly say that the system has been operational in full for any length of time. Uh, I think that is entirely unworkable. Should the Parliament determine that a review of the kind Mr Griffin envisages is necessary, it can simply ask the Commission to do it without adhering to a rigid schedule that is outlined in the amendment. And should the Parliament decide, for whatever reason, that a person or body other than the Commission is more appropriate, there is nothing to stop the Parliament from commissioning such a review. Uh, I'd also highlight that apart from any periodic review that may be organised, the system and its un underpinning legislation will already be subject to robust and continuous monitoring through the various reporting duties the Bill places on Ministers, the scrutiny of the Parliament, including of this committee, and the Parliament's Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee, the role of the Commission, the separate procedures relating to the Charter, and the scrutiny that will be undertaken by Audit Scotland. A strong set of arrangements to identify any areas of the system that require change and refinement, legislative or otherwise. So I question the need to take what I think is a highly unusual step of setting out in primary legislation a requirement for independent reviews of whether that legislation is fit for purpose. It seems to me that such oversight and scrutiny is principally the job of this Parliament and that the amendment therefore may set a very unwise precedent. For all of these reasons, I would ask the committee not to support this amendment. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Balfour to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I've heard the Minister and um, I accept her comments in regard to my amendment seated to and I will not be uh, pressing that. Um, I think uh, other members have spoken in regard to Amendment 79 um, and I, I fully agree with those, those comments. Um, I do think we do not want to go down any kind of road that sees... Uh, disability benefits and other benefits either means tested or being, people being put off in any way because they think it is linked to income. So I, 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 I absolutely agree. And I also agree in regard to 148 and 80. I mean, I do think this could become quite time consuming. I think it is over prescriptive. And in particularly Amendment 80, 
uh, until the bill or the act has been up and running for a number of years, then I think it is difficult to judge how successful it will be in practice. And I also do think that that is a role for this parliament to be taking part. And I do hope that uh, whoever is re-elected in 2021 after due course will have a look at this and it will be reviewed. But I think that should be done by a committee within this parliament, uh, not by somebody else. So um, I won't, won't be supporting 148 or 80. Thank you, Mr. Balfour. Is the committee content that Amendment 62 be withdrawn? Please. Thank you. Uh, call Amendment 79 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 62, and ask Mr. Griffin to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 79 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Um, can I ask those in favour of Amendment 79 to please raise their hands? Those against? The result of the division are three votes for and six for votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 108 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with amendment 62, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. The question is that amendment 108 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Did I hear a no there? Is everybody agreed? Yes. Agreed. Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, and we move to the question that section six be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, and now move to a new grouping, um, Scottish Commission on Social Security. And I call amendment 15 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendment 16, 16A, 16B, 118, 49, 53 and 54 and ask Minister to move Amendment 15 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, let me start by saying that I'm happy to support Amendment 16A and 16B lodged by Mr Balfour, with the caveat that we will want to tidy up the wording uh, at Stage 3 to avoid any confusion that the reference to tribunal members refers to both Scottish tribunals and the equivalent England and Wales uh, bodies. But the principle that members of the House of Lords and of the first tier tribunal and upper tribunal should not be appointed as commissioners is one I have no difficulty with. Uh, on amendments 15 uh, through to 54, I think the committee is probably clear what the purpose of these amendments uh, is and the effect that they will have, which is uh, to bring into being the Scottish Commission on Social Security. It will be similar to, but in a number of important ways, an improvement on the UK arrangements which allow for scrutiny of elements of the existing UK system by the Social Security Advisory Committee. As we discussed a fortnight ago, these, these amendments will enable the Commission to deliver all of the requirements of an independent scrutiny body set out by the expert working group in its report. Its primary role will be to scrutinise regulations and Scottish ministers and the Scottish Parliament will also be able to ask it to report on any matter relevant to social security that is wanted. Um, the amendments also recognise the Commission's role in relation to our social security charter. Amendment 118 will enable the Commission to have regard to international human rights instruments in performing any of its functions. And as we said earlier, what that means is an independent group of experts will be constantly reviewing the Scottish social security system and judging it against international law standards. Of course, the Scottish Government and indeed this Parliament should always be seeking to uphold international obligations. But placing this duty on the Commission will ensure that the Government, the Parliament and for that matter the wider Scottish public will have the benefit advice from experts in the field about what the international standards require. Convener, as I've said, these amendments give clear and unequivocal effect to the Scottish Government's committee, uh, commitment to introduce a statutory independent scrutiny body. The schedule which we propose to add to the Bill makes provision for the establishment of that body. Put together, I think these amendments deliver something genuinely new and important, and I hope the committee will support them and I move them in my name. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Balfour to speak to Amendment 16A and the other amendments in the group? Um, Convener, due to uh, time, I'm, I'm, I'm with the 
A Minister's comments uh, in my ears, um, I simply move 16A and 16B without comment. Thank you. Um, Mr Tomkins, you indicated... Yeah, thank you, uh, Convener. We, we support the Government's um, amendments in, in this group. We think that the creation of the Statutory Commission is an extremely important uh, step forward. It was called for, I think, by this committee in its Stage 1 uh, report. Um, uh, and we welcome the functions that are to be given to that um, commission by the Minister's amendments. But um, I think it's extremely important to pause... <coughs> Um, and to consider that, um, welcome as it is, um, the uh, scrutiny uh, by the new statutory commission of draft regulations to be made under this legislation after it's enacted um, is necessary, but is not a substitute for effective parliamentary scrutiny. And what we need um, is both the uh, work of the statutory commission um, in accordance with the uh, amendments that the minister is um, moving this morning <coughs> and a super affirmative procedure in this parliament given the nature and sensitivity and detail and substance of what is to be determined by those regulations. This is not just uh, my view, convener, it's not just the view of my party, it's the view of the all party delegated powers and regulatory reform, if that's the right name for it, that's not the right name for it, the delegated powers and law reform committee um, uh, of this parliament. So the, um, uh, uh, this committee wrote um, to what I'm gonna call the GPLR committee, um, uh, a, a few weeks ago to seek that committee's view um, uh, about the government's amendments with regard to the creation of a Scottish Commission on Social Security. And we received a response on the 6th of February. And I think it's important, um, uh, convener, to read not all of that response, but a little bit of that response into the record for today. And the committee uh, tells us, uh, convener, that a num in a number of respects, the Scottish government's recommendations do not meet the DPLR committee's uh, recommendations. The establishment of the commission as an independent scrutiny body is to be welcomed, they say. Um, however, in the DPLR committee's view, its role in relation to the scrutiny of proposals to make draft regulations undermines the ability of the parliament to hold the government to account and shape the draft regulations. Those are unambiguous words that this committee must take into account, it seems to me. Uh, the approach that the government is proposing uh, with regard to the creation of the Commission is a uh, unique approach to super affirmative procedure, say the DPLR committee. Um, parliamentary consideration would be only an adjunct to the work of the Commission. Now, um, it seems to me, um, uh, convener, that these are exceptionally important matters. They go to the core of one of this committee's main concerns about this bill in the stage one, uh, in our stage one inquiry, which was the appropriateness of the balance between primary and secondary legislation. Now that is, we've, I've discussed this with the minister before, that is a judgment call. There is no one right answer to getting the balance right between primary and secondary, but it is clearly the unambiguous view of the DPLR committee which is this Parliament's committee that's charged with the responsibility to monitor precisely this matter, that even as amended, this bill does not get that balance right. So I um, will uh, work with other opposition parties, and I will work, I hope, also with the Scottish Government to seek to put this right at stage three. I unreservedly welcome um, the Government's amendments in this group, and I will support them enthusiastically, but they are necessary but they are not of themselves sufficient. We need, in addition to the uh, statutory um, commission that will scrutinize from an expert point of view, um, uh, draft regulations to be uh, made in due course by ministers, we need, in addition to that, appropriate parliamentary scrutiny. And the bill, even as amended, will not allow for that. And this is an issue which we will have to revisit uh, at stage three. And I would like to be able to work with the government uh, to do that, but if the government uh, are uh, of the view that they want to stick with this and not move any further, then I'll work with our other opposition parties to seek to get this right at stage three, because in my view and in the DPLR committee's view, we have not got it right yet, even after this group of amendments, uh, which I hope will be supported. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Um, does anyone else wish to come in? Um, I can invite the Minister to wind up. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, as I said, I, I support all amendments in this group. Uh, and in that regard, I, I do not want to say much more on the amendments in this group, but I do want uh, to take the opportunity to respond to the points that Mr. Tompkins made. I'm grateful uh, for his support for uh, the establishment of the Commission, his enthusiastic support, I noted, and I am grateful for that. 
I, I do not hit the points that he makes uh, on super affirmative procedure and, of course, uh, the comments that have come from the DPLR committee. Uh, establishing the committee, uh, the commission rather, uh, as a unique move uh, does, of course, uh, not of, in and of itself uh, mean that it, it uh, has no contribution to make to a super affirmative process. Um, and as Mr. Tompkins said, there is no right way, uh, a right view in the balance that you strike uh, between primary and secondary legislation. Uh, so whilst I note the, the comments of uh, the committee and the comments that Mr. Tompkins has made, I, I should in fairness say I do not necessarily therefore agree with all of them. However, uh, it would be a very foolish government indeed that did not pay attention to those points when they're raised. And I am certainly willing to reflect on those and to have further discussions uh, with Mr. Tompkins and other members of this committee, if they wish it, uh, in advance of stage three, to see if we can reach a view that provides additional reassurance to members of this committee and also, of course, to DPLR in terms of the Parliament's role in all of these matters. Thank you, Minister. Um, the question is, that Amendment 15 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes, thank you. I call the Amendment 16 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 15 and ask the Minister to move formally. Moved. I call Amendment 16A in the name of Jeremy Balfour already debated with Amendment 15 and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move. Move. Thank you, Mr Balfour. Uh, the question is that Amendment 16A be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 16B, I think I said 18. A there, I meant 16. Yeah. All right, I call Amendment 16B in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 15. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 16B be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 16. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And I call Amendment 118 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 15, and I ask the Minister to formally move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 118 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 61, and ask the Minister to formally move. Yeah. It moved. Think, yeah. Oh, no, I think you indicated earlier that No, you sorry, to... um, my apologies. Yeah. It, you, it's Amendment 18? Uh -huh. Yes, I'm not moving. Thank you, Minister. I will therefore not call Amendment 18A. And uh, the next call is for Amendment 148 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 62. Mark Griffin to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 148 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Can I ask that um, members in favour of 148 raise their hands? And those against? Thank you. Okay. The result of the division are three votes for, six votes against the amendment and no abstentions. The, the uh, amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 80 in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 62, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 80 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Um, we are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Can I ask that those in favour of Amendment 18 please show their hands? And 80. 80, sorry. And those against? And any abstentions? Okay. Um, the result of the division are three votes for and six votes against and no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Um, so um, I now move to a new grouping on the creation of new benefits. I call Amendment 119 in the name of Adam Tompkins, Group with Amendments 63, 121, 122, 123, 124, 
125 and 130 and ask Mr Tomkins to move Amendment 119 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Um, th thank you, Kavina. I move Amendment 119 in my name. Um, the um, Scottish social security system comprises three parts. It comprises, first, the um, streams of assistance which are devolved in full, including, for example, carers' assistance and disability assistance. Second, it comprises the power to top up any reserved benefit. Um, and that power is provided for in section 45 of this bill as introduced. And third, um, it, it, it also includes the power to create new benefits within devolved competence. Those are the three parts of the package um, of devolved social security that were agreed by all the parties represented in this parliament in the Smith Commission um, and which are legislated for uh, in the uh, provisions of the Scotland Act uh, 2016. Um, this bill, as introduced, deals with the first part of that package, and it deals with the second part of that package, but it says nothing about the third part of that package. And the amendments uh, in my name in this group are designed to put that right. It seems to me inappropriate that um, the found this is a, you know, we, we, we all agree that this is a, a, a foundation piece of legislation, one of the most important pieces of the legislation that this parliament is going to uh, enact. Um, uh, because it puts onto a, a Scottish statutory footing devolved Scottish social security. But as introduced, it does that with regard to only two-thirds of the three-part package that was agreed unanimously around the Smith Commission at table. And uh, I, I think that it is um, um, uh, unfortunate um, that uh, there is no provision in the bill to deal with the power to create new benefits. So that is the purpose behind the amendments in this group. The purpose behind the amendments in this group in my name is to ensure that this legislation puts onto the Scottish statute book all three <laughs> elements of devolved social security. The benefits that are, d are devolved in full, the power to top up, and the power to create new benefits within devolved competence. So um, uh, amendment 119, which is the first amendment in this group, uh, seeks to amend section seven, which defines what the Scottish social security system is. This matters because the principles in section one and the charter in section two will apply to the Scottish social security system. And that definition should include all three parts of this package that I've described. Um, so uh, amendment 119 and amendment 63, which are as it were alternatives to one another. Um, uh, we don't need them both, but I think we need one of them. Um, uh, amends section seven to ensure um, that, the, that any new benefits which are in the future created under this power to create new benefits fall within the scope of the statutory definition of the Scottish social security system and that therefore the principles in section one and the charter in section two will apply to those benefits, to their design to the, and to their delivery uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the uh, other amendments in the group seek to um, add uh, to this legislation um, the power to create new benefits um, uh, and do so in a manner which is uh, fully consistent with the way in which Scottish ministers want to design and deliver the benefits which are fully, de fully devolved. That's to say, um, uh, the, the regulation-making powers are um, uh, in these amendments are the same uh, as the regulation-making powers uh, that the um, Scottish Government are seeking to promote um, through uh, the amendments that we've just um, uh, discussed and uh, decided upon. These are regulations that would have to be laid before the Scottish Commission on Social Security for their um, advice and input and so on and so forth. So the process is entirely the same. Um, uh, and the, uh, as I've said, the purpose behind um, these amendments is to ensure that this legislation captures the whole of, and not just some of, devolved social security in Scotland, because at the moment the legislation doesn't do that, and that is, I think, a significant, I would say, fundamental flaw uh, with it. Thank you. Um, just for the record, can you move Amendment 119, Mr. I did. That's the first thing I said. Thank you. My benefit. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McPherson. Th thank you, convener. I think the... I have some concerns around these amendments around something that Mr Tompkins discussed very passionately a number of moments ago with regard to a different group, which is an, an appreciation of appropriate parliamentary scrutiny. While I, I appreciate that the, the Scotland Act 2016 allows uh, Parliament to consider legislation to create new benefits, 
Section 28 of the Scotland Act 2016 does not give the Scottish Parliament or Scottish ministers the power to create new benefits. All transfers of responsibility are from Parliament to Parliament, and quite rightly, in my view, no responsibility is transferred directly to the Scottish Government. So, my concerns around this set of amendments, and it's actually stated within the regulations themselves that you know, this would be by virtue of, if these amendments were passed, the, the, the power we'd be giving to the Scottish Government would allow them, by virtue of regulations, to create new benefits. And I don't think giving that power by virtue of regulations provides adequate parliamentary scrutiny for such significant development. This Social Security Bill, as drafted, brings forward primary legislation in order to create the benefits that uh, we envisage taking forward that are, are being devolved. The same process, in my view, should be undertaken for creating new benefits. That is a significant development that will, would be a, a, a very substantial policy proposal to create a new benefit. And I think that the creation of new benefits should be done through primary legislation. This set of amendments would allow such significant steps to be taken through regulations, and I don't think that would provide the same scrutiny that would, in my view, be appropriate for the creation of such new benefits, and therefore I won't be able to support them. Thank you, Ms. McPherson. Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Kamira. Um, we said um, from the beginning that um, we support the the principle that the power to create new benefits um, should be transposed within the bill. But I think we would share the, the very same concerns that um, Ben McPherson has, has set out, that um, any new benefit that the, the government or um, anyone else was proposing, we would expect to see that come to Parliament um, through primary legislation to give full scrutiny to, to this or any other committee to um, go out to consultation to take evidence at stage one to potentially amend it at stage two and um, to give Parliament that full role in scrutinising and, and strengthening um, any new uh, benefit which was being proposed by um, the government or any individual member um, through a, a private member's bill and so would not be supporting um, these amendments in this form uh, purely because they relate to giving a minister's power to, to introduce a new benefit um, by regulation, and we would much prefer to see any new uh, a benefit being created by introduced being by being introduced by enactment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Ms. Johns? Um, yes, I, I do commend um, Adam Tompkins for his passionate commitment to ensuring that this Parliament uses its new powers to the max. But I think um, if we introduce new benefits in the way Mr Tomkins suggests, we won't be able to scrutinise the proposals to, to the maximum. Um, and I think the creation of new benefits is so important that each and every opportunity we have to consult and to scrutinise is, is absolutely essential to make sure the benefits deliver as we would wish. So I will not be supporting those amendments. Thank you. Uh, Ms McNeill? Yep, I just wanted to put um, on record, I'm grateful to Mr Tompkins for, for raising this issue a number of times and reminding the committee that part of the provision in Scotland Act, the ministers must be clear they have the powers to create new benefits. Um, I was a bit torn by it, if I'm honest, because I would have preferred there to be reference in this bill so it were clear that we have those powers. Um, but since the question that Mr Tompkins raised earlier, which I have to say I'm 100% behind, which is to fully resolve the question of how the parliamentary committees will scrutinise any draft regulations, I'm much more comfortable with the idea for the moment that it would be primary legislation. Um, I do, however, agree that there should be specific references um, in the and the primary legislation is a belt and braces, as I suppose, to ensure that what we've just discussed in relation to the Charter and the importance of the Charter apply to any new benefits. Um, and I wondered if there was any scope uh, for consensus around that 
uh, if, if not. So I'm sympathetic to the idea. My only objection to it is just the procedure that if you're given a choice between primary legislation and secondary legislation, given what we've just discussed, um, I would be much more comfortable that ministers would have to have a full consultation prior to the introduction of a new benefit, which would mean all the organisations that come to us, the committee would have the right to have its own consultation in that process, and then we'll go through this um, line by line, um, would be my preference for a new benefit, albeit I, I'm, I'm with Mr Tompkins on what he's trying to do, I think, which is to make sure that we're fully aware that the, the Parliament has these full powers and that all of the Charter and all of the uh, things we've just been discussing about the principles that would apply to that would apply to any new benefits as well. Mr Adam. I'll be very uh, brief, but basically, as Mr McPherson already said, it's transfer of to Parliament to Parliament, and the Scottish Government can't on its own do that. There's, I am, if not practical in everything I'm trying to do, and the practical, you only have two choices in that scenario, which would be, uh, one, the Scottish Government uh, legislates every time it wants to create a new uh, uh, the benefit, and it goes through primary legislation, which has more scrutiny and everybody else gets the opportunity. Or uh, you delegate the powers to the Scottish Government to create via regulations, which I don't think any of us would be too keen on the idea, because I think, as everyone else has already mentioned, that kind of bypasses uh, the whole structure of the Scottish Parliament itself. And uh, I would prefer, and I know the government's uh, option is for uh, the Scottish Government to have to legislate it in primary legislation every time it creates a new benefit. So for me, it's just a very practical way of moving forward. Okay, thank you. Can I invite the Minister to respond to the group? Uh, thank you, Convener. Let me start by making it clear, as I'm sure Mr Tompkins and others know, that Section 28 of the Scotland Act 2016 provides an exception to the reservation of Social Security matters. And that is not a power that anybody other than this Parliament can exercise, or at least cannot exercise without the Parliament's consent. So as colleagues have said, what we as members of the Scottish Parliament have before us is a choice. We can either choose to delegate this power to Scottish ministers on a case-by-case -case basis to provide for new benefits when the need for a new benefit is identified and create them via primary legislation so that Parliament can, as has been said, uh, take evidence, debate and set out the purpose of any new benefit and its essential features in terms of who should be paid and what they should be paid. Or we can delegate the powers wholesale which is what I believe Mr Tompkins is proposing we do via his amendments, which would insert a general provision into the bill, enabling ministers to create new benefits by regulations. Given the discussion that we have had moments ago around the need uh, in the view of committee members of uh, DPLR and that government is willing to consider further in terms of improvements to the super affirmative procedure, I think it would be contradictory for us now to go and uh, pass an amendment that hands that blanket provision to ministers. Mr Tompkins' amendments do allow for regulations created under this new power to be scrutinised by the Commission, but they don't allow for the full scrutiny that would be applied to primary legislation. Uh, and I think that, uh, as members have said, uh, that is entirely the wrong way to go. I do not believe it is necessary uh, to put in the face of the bill that uh, Parliament has the power to create new benefits as uh, that power uh, comes with the uh, restrictions and constraints, but nonetheless, there as it does from the Scotland Act, we will at some point later in this committee's proceedings indeed uh, debate and discuss as part of primary legislation the creation of a new benefit under housing assistance. And I think that is entirely the correct way to do this uh, to maintain appropriate balance uh, between creating benefits in primary legislation and delivering them via regulations. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Mr Tomkins to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, Kavina. Um, and thank you to all the members who have con contributed to this, to this, to, to this debate. L let me give an example of the kind of thing that I think we're talking about here. Um, let's suppose that we identify in Scotland that there's a particular problem with people leaving terms of imprisonment and sleeping rough. And we want to create a new benefit that is directed um, at um, prisoners being released from um, imprisonment uh, so that they uh, don't have to sleep on the streets and that they have some kind of um, a temporary accommodation provided for them. That's the kind of new benefit that could be created um, uh, um, by us 
uh, that falls completely within devolved competence. Um, both uh, justice and housing are within devolved competence. This is the sort of thing that we could do. Now, at, right now, at the moment, if ministers identified that that was a problem in Scotland, then ministers could use their budgets, and there are about £75 million in the community's portfolio budget for this year's budget, um, uh, uh, to design and deliver an ad hoc scheme of assistance, perhaps a kind of housing first scheme of assistance to um, uh, prisoners being released from jail to prevent them from um, sleeping rough on the streets. And there would be absolutely no parliamentary scrutiny of that at all. It could all be done through ministers using their spending powers. And the only scrutiny that we would have is the scrutiny annually in the budget process to decide whether we really wanted to give £75 million to this portfolio or whether we thought that that £75 million would be better assigned to some uh, other uh, portfolio in some other way. So uh, far from uh, designing a scheme here which reduces parliamentary scrutiny, what I've tried to do is to design a scheme here which increases parliamentary scrutiny. At the moment, these, these things could happen without any parliamentary uh, scrutiny uh, at all. However, um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really interesting example. I mean, um, it just occurred to me then, if that's your concern, would it be possible to put on the face of the bill that the creation of new benefits would be done by primary legislation rather than regulation? Well, um, that, that, that's an interesting question. I think the, I, I think the um, sensible thing to do um, at, at this point, given the range of you know, very strong um, exceptions that have been put to the, to the scheme uh, as proposed by me here, uh, is not for these amendments to be pressed at this point, but for us to pause and think in advance of stage three about whether there is a, a more satisfactory way of ensuring that this bill reflects um, the reality of the power in Section 28 of the Scotland Act, which is the power to create new benefits, as well as the power to top up and the, and, and the powers to create new benefits. So I, I don't propose to press any of the amendments in this group except for one. Uh, the one amendment which I do propose to press is Amendment 63. Amendment 63 um, uh, simply alters, it increases, it enlarges the definition um, of the Scottish social security system within Section 7 of the Act um, to ensure that any future enactment, that's to say primary legislation, which contains provision exercising the power provided for in Section 28 of the mm -hmm. Scotland Act to create new benefits falls within the definition of the Scottish social security system and that any future use by this or any other government of that power through primary legislation uh, would therefore be captured uh, by both the principles and the charter, both the principles, to say, both the principles and the charter would uh, apply to that. So that is not a um, uh, an amendment which seeks to delegate any parliamentary or legislative power to ministers. It's simply a tidying up exercise that uh, ensures that the definition of Scottish social security system complies with what the Smith Commission intended and complies with what the uh, Scotland Act 2016 uh, enacts. So I will press that amendment when we come to a convener, but I will not press the others in this group in my name. Are the committee content that um, Amendment 119 be withdrawn? Yes. Thank you. Um, I call Amendment 63 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with 119, and ask Mr Tompkins to move or not move. Move. Uh, so the question is that Amendment 63 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Um, there will be a division. Uh, the question is that Amendment 63 is agreed. Those in favour, please raise their th hands. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you. Sorry, we didn't get Alison's vote there. Oh, sorry, um, clerks haven't um, been able to, to get the whole vote. Can I ask for those for the amendment to raise, please raise their hands? Those against? And abstentions? Uh, uh, the result of the division are um, three votes for, five votes against and one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed. Um, I'm conscious of time and as we're about to move to a new grouping, can we have a comfort break? I'd ask members to be back at 10.36 at the latest ready to commence. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, we now move to uh, the next group, which is definition of so, uh, so Scottish Social Security System. And I call Amendment 120 in the name of Mark Griffin and a group on its own and ask Mr Griffin to move and speak to the amendment. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, moving Amendment 120, I will be brief since it's in a group on its own. Um, I th feel that the definition of a Scot Scottish Social Security is currently too narrow and fails to take account of other schemes which are already devolved and support low-income households. Um, amendments to automate benefits on the take-up of assistance and income maximisation that we passed in the session last week largely rely on the existing Scottish Social Security system definition, and I feel that widening this definition would give additional weight to the ambition in um, these clauses. This Amendment 120 would ensure the, the same principles and safeguards afforded to devolved centralised social security are extended to devolved locally administered schemes. And I would ask members to support um, Amendment 120. Okay. For my benefit, can you just formally move 120? Yeah, moved. Thanks, Mr Griffin. Um, do any other members wish to come in? Ms Boyer? Thank you, Convener. Um, I have concerns about this amendment, um, principally in that it's bringing in things that are not going to be delivered by the Social Security Agency. So a question that I would have for Mark Griffin would be um, thinking about, I suppose, school, school meal and clothing grants, um, discussing housing payments as well, um, and council tax reduction. In fact, many of these things are delivered by local authorities. So. What consultation have you carried out with local authorities um, to understand the implications of applying the principles and the charter um, to the delivery of school meals and clothing grants, for example? Any other members wish to? Sorry, one. Okay. Yeah, I'll be very <laughs> quick. I suppose another key thing is what redress would people have um, if, if they felt the local authority had not carried it out properly? Thank you. Um, could I invite the Minister to speak to the group? Thank you. Um, in my opinion, the Amendment 120 from Mr Griffin extends the definition of uh, Scottish Social Security system to matters over which Scottish ministers have no direct control, such as the delivery of school meals and clothing grants, which are the responsibility of local authorities. The amendment also makes unrelated matters subject to the Charter, but then fails to follow this through and consider the implications for Charter redress. So I do not support the amendment, which puts in place a perverse system of accountabilities, in my opinion, where people are accountable for the delivery of certain things they have no hand in delivering, and people who deliver them are not accountable. The amendment creates additional confusion and in effect provides for apparent accountability, which is in practice false. Uh, logically, if the amendment is supported and ministers are to be held accountable, it would be wise for ministers to seriously consider assuming direct delivery for some of these services, a consequence in terms of how our local authorities may feel, as well as the locality of those delivery, which I'm sure Mr Griffin uh, would not wish us to pursue. There are a number of questions in terms of how an individual who believes that they have not received uh, the correct support or in the manner via local authority assistance would achieve meaningful redress. And so I, I urge the committee not to support this amendment. Thank you. Can I invite Mr Griffin to wind up and press or withdraw the amendment? Thank you, Commissioner. I take on board the points that have been made and will not be pressing this amendment. Um, I think we will uh, seek to achieve the ambition, which is um, to, to link um, some of the, the positive changes that we have already made um, around um, take-up of assistance, um, income max maximisation and um, automation um, of assistance in ways which are more likely to, to gather support of a uh, committee and um, uh, address the point of, of consultation that Ruth Maguire um, raises, so I will not be pressing um, Amendment 120 and seek to withdraw. Thank you. Are the committee content that that be withdrawn? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, the question is that Section 7B 
be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, we now move to a uh, new grouping on social uh, Scottish Social Security Agency and to call Amendment 149 in the name of Pauline McNeill, grouped with Amendment 151. I ask Ms McNeill to move Amendment 149 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you very much. Um, these amendments um, are probing amendments at the moment. I just want to see um, what, why I, I, I submitted them. Um, the primary concept behind 149 is to ensure that ministers carrying out the functions have regard to the social security principles. Um, some of the organisations that gave us evidence, as the committee have heard, are concerned that the current UK system does not pe treat people with dignity and respect. And that's, of course, enshrined in the Charter and as a primary theme of the new Social Security Agency created by the Scotland Act and in this Bill. To ensure that the principles in the Bill will be applied and that ministers will be held to, to account if they're not upheld. To ensure a clear duty that ministers have to have to regard to all of the principles and the Charter when framing any regulations or guidance overseeing the operation of a new Social Security Agency. Um, the amendments are designed to give greater accountability to ensure a right-based culture, I suppose its bail embraces. Uh, now, I'm aware that the Minister is probably going to draw attention to a letter which she's issued, to, certainly to me, I don't know how widely that circulated, suggesting that the wording of it is maybe not even designed to do that. Um, I, I'm just interested to hear what the Minister has to say. Um, uh, the Minister may well take the view that it's covered by other amendments and other provisions in the Bill. Um, but I'd like to hear the response to that. So I move Amendment 149. Thank you. Um, would any other members like to speak to this group? Oh, can I invite the Minister to respond? Thank you. Um, uh, as perhaps Ms McNeill anticipated, uh, uh, the Scottish Government opposes these amendments and our rationale for that is because we believe they are unnecessary. As the committee heard last week in relation to Mr Balfour's Amendment 60, Duties which the Bill places on ministers are automatically and legally placed on the agency. Nothing further needs to be said in the Bill. Its silence about the agency is deliberate and correct. Adding these amendments would have unintended consequences because they make provision for the agency to carry out all functions related to Social Security, which ministers may carry out under the Act. They would give the agency the power to carry out various functions, which it simply would not be appropriate for an agency to undertake. It means that the agency would be able to make subordinate legislation, for example, which is one of the minister's functions under the Act. If the concern behind these amendments is that ministers might create some form of unaccountable body to deliver Social Security, then I think the reassurance that we have in passing uh, Mr Adams' amendment last week, Amendment 77, that the bill, that the delivery of Social Security is a public service, is assurance uh, enough in that regard. So we oppose these amendments. We believe they are unnecessary and would have un unwelcome consequences. And I would urge Ms McNeill not to press them. Okay. Um, I invite Polly McNeill to wind up and to press or withdraw her amendment. I think in view of what the Minister um, has said, I, I think um, I'm persuaded, actually, that they're not required. I think uh, all of the things I would seek to achieve are supported in other aspects of the, um, of the bill so far. So I therefore seek to withdraw 149. Thank you. Um, the committee content that that be withdrawn? Thank you. Um, uh, we now you move to a uh, new grouping on residence conditions and I call Amendment 64 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with Amendment 65, 66, 70, 71, 72, 73, 153A and 76. And ask Mr Balfour to move Amendment 64 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Um, I move Amendment 64, convener, um, in regard to residency conditions. I have to say, one of the things that surprised me most um, about the, the bill when it was first published um, last summer was that there was no definition of residency within the bill. Um, the bill, as published, gave no indication as to uh, what 
an individual would have to do to get this benefit, where they would have to live, how long they would have to live there for, or anything like that. And it was almost, I think, and others who've got better knowledge than me, almost unique in regard to this type of bill in not having any residency within it. It was just completely blank. And I know, having spoken to many uh, organisations and charities, that they too were bemused uh, by this lack of definition. What I have uh, sought to do in regard to Amendment Number 64 is to put in um, a fairly standard residency condition, uh, which you will find in other statutes um, already passed. I think this absolutely clarifies um, at, the, at the basic level of, of what you have to do to be able to get receipt of this benefit, how long you had to have lived uh, within Scotland. I understand the government's intention is that they want to have a residency clause for each of the benefits that are coming forward. I think that goes in contradiction to what they are trying to do in regard to this piece of legislation, and that is make it understandable and open uh, to people to claim. If we are literally going to have a residency, slightly different residency clause for each of the different benefits and any benefits that might come in future years, how are people going to know to apply? Will it put people off applying? And if there's different rules, um, if they don't get one, will they think, well, I, I, I feel the residency clause on that one, I'm not going to apply for another one. Now, I do accept the government's perspective that for some of the benefits, there does need to be um, a tweaking of Amendment 64. And my intention at this stage will be to withdraw these amendments and maybe hopefully work with the government in coming up with a general residency condition with the provision that where it is required and only where it is required for a particular benefit that they could be altered by regulation brought forward by a minister. I genuinely do believe that we need a residency condition at the heart of this bill so that people know how to apply and what those conditions are that they can apply for. But I do accept that Amendment 64 doesn't quite achieve what I want to achieve in regard to that. And I hope that the government will uh, work with me or other opposition groups will work with me in regard to getting that. Um, but I would be interested um, at this stage maybe just to get some view of where the government is in regard to that. Thank you. Thank you. Do other members wish to come in, Mr Adam? Ms. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, uh, basically, I know uh, Jeremy Balfour has been bringing this up at every section, every t the whole process, and we, it was only self that brought this issue up. And I, I don't decry that it's an important issue uh, as well. But my, in my own way of looking at it, the way it stands, it's effectively in primary legislation. Would it not give us more, fri uh, more flexibility if it was in regulations to be able to change it as and when uh, things are going forward? And uh, it, it really makes it difficult, in my opinion, to uh, it just makes it more complex the way he's currently got it. But I, I do agree that Mr. Balfour's already said that he wants to work with others to try and make it work. Uh, but I do have concerns. We need to, uh, if we do go down this route, we have to get it correct and you get it right and it's 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 one of the issues it wasn't one of the major issues in the whole debate that we had but if we do go down this route we have to get it the right way miss mcneil um, yes i also think that jeremy balfour has brought a, a, an important issue um to the committee for consideration and i agree the wording of it could be critical uh, in the operation of the act and um, when it comes to pass um i would just like to be clear though what it is you're trying to capture. Um, the term residency has a specific legal meaning for most pieces of legislation, which I think is usually three years. Um, and I'm not, I wonder there might be some confusion if you continue to use that term, uh, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. I have assumed that um, w what you're trying to achieve is, I suppose, when people move their permanent address, which is perfectly legitimate to move from um, living in England to Scotland, so you might, you might 
be obviously governed by the new living benefits, and the rules need to be clear about that. I just wanted to clarify that is what you're trying to capture, and if that is the case, so what, do you, can you say to the committee what, what happens now under the UK system? So if you move your address from Birmingham to Glasgow, um, what do you have to show to show that to, to the UK agency um, that you've moved? I understand it will make a difference because the benefits will be different, but I just wondered if, why would you not follow the same um, process? We'd be interested to hear if you can answer any of those. Okay, uh, Ms. Johnson. Yes, I, I would be grateful, Mr. Balfour, if you could elaborate on the the time scales that you present. Not less than 104 weeks out of 156. Is that based on? You know, is that based on some sort of consultation? Um, you know, is is it based on Westminster legislation? I'd be interested to understand where those precise figures came from when you're summing up. Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite the minister to speak to the group? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful to Mr. Balfour for his indication that he does not intend to press these amendments. Um, I do think that as they stand. Uh, they would, uh, Amendment 61, uh, creates an absolute requirement that a person must be present in Scotland for a period of two out of the last three years to qualify for all of the forms of assistance outlined in Chapter 2 of the Bill. Uh, a blanket presence that is incorrectly applied actually to Scotland rather than to the wider UK. Um, our legislative approach to residency reflects the general commitment to minimise complexity the intention is to set out residency conditions in the regulations for each form of assistance uh, for, a for, for good reasons. Uh, it reduces the scope for confusion and allows the full eligibility criteria for each benefit to be set out in one place. It's also sensible because residency and presence criteria may differ for different types of assistance. For example, disability event benefits may include temporary absence and presence conditions that are not relevant in the case of other devolved benefits, such as Best Start Grant. And a single set of criteria may therefore be unworkable. And whilst I am always content to discuss further with members uh, how uh, the uh, issue that is uh, pressing on them uh, may be accommodated uh, in uh, primary legislation in this case, I, I have to say that I think finding a general clause which is then deliverable in regulations which of necessity will vary from benefit to benefit um, will be a difficult ask. Perfectly happy uh, to look and see if, we, if it can be done, but I think it is a very difficult uh, ask indeed not least because we also, in benefit by benefit, have to take account of um, residency uh, requirements uh, in other matters, uh, not least in terms of EU nationals and so on. So I, I'm pleased that Mr Balfour, um, and uh, I'm grateful to him for not pressing uh, these amendments. Uh, I am happy uh, to continue discussion with him on whether or not uh, what he wishes uh, is something that the government could support, but I do feel obliged to say that I think finding a, a form of words for a general condition in primary legislation uh, will be a difficult one, and one that, depending on how it is worded, as currently is the case with Amendment 65, could not be amended by regulations. Um, so we would be um, boxing ourselves into a very tight corner indeed but I am happy to look at that. Thank you, Minister. Can I, and I invite Jeremy Balfour to wind up and to press or withdraw his amendment. Thank you. I, I am conscious of time, so I will be brief in my summing up. Um, to answer um, Alison Johnson's uh, question in regard to um, the, the time scales, these are taken from other bits of legislation in regard to res the residency clauses. I mean, I suppose at the most extreme, if you don't have a residency definition, anyone can apply for a Scottish benefit. We have to have some kind of understanding that this benefit are for people who live in Scotland and reside in Scotland. And I think that is what I'm trying to at least get to the basic point. But if I live in Cornwall, I can't suddenly start applying for Scottish benefits. And, and that is my concern as the face of the bill was. And I accept that they will come with regulation, but I still think it is important 
that we have a, at least an attempt at having a definition of um, what it means to be able to get a, benefit, a Scottish benefit in regard to residency, and I will try to work with the Minister and others in regard to that. But at this stage, I withdraw um, Amendment 64 um, and 65, 66, 70, 71, 72, 73, 153 a and 76. Um, uh, so the Questions Committee, is there content that that be withdrawn? Thank you. Um, I now call Amendment 121 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 119, and ask Mr Tompkins to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Um, I now call Amendment 122 in the name of Adam Tompkins, already debated with Amendment 119, and ask Mr Tompkins to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Uh, and the question is that Section 8 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Um, are you. We now move to a new group in determination by Supreme Court. And I call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister and a group in its own and ask the Minister to move and to speak to Amendment 19. Thank you, Convener. I'll be very brief. Amendment 19 is a technical adjustment to make clear on the face of the bill that it is possible for an appeal to end with a decision of the UK Supreme Court. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak to this amendment? No. Um, Minister, do you wish to wind up? Um, I will wind up formally, Convener. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes thank you. Uh, so the question is that section 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And the question is that section 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Move to next grouping, which is more than one cared for person. And I call amendment 173 in the name of Alison Johnson, grouped with amendments 174, 175, 176, 177, 178, 179, 180, 181 and 183 and I invite Ms Johnson to move Amendment 173 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Convener. Since lodging these amendments, um, I've discovered that in the lawyer's world, as Ms Freeman pointed <laughs> out earlier, um, an individual can be more than one person. Um, prior to lodging these amendments, I was of the view, as I'm sure many colleagues are, that an individual was indeed <laughs> only one person. And if only I could be more than one individual when it came to voting. Um, <laughs> but, alas, it seems that it's, that's not the case. Um, that being the case, and having now acquainted myself with Section 22 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010, um, I will therefore be withdrawing um, amendments 173, 174, 175, 177, 78, 79, I'm terrified of getting this wrong, um, 80. 81, um, I, I will be retaining 81 and 176 at the moment for further discussion, um, and I'd like to go on to that now if I may. Um, during stage one, many groups representing carers um, who gave oral evidence or submitted written evidence raised the issue of carers who provide care for more than one person. And these, group, these groups include Carers Scotland, Carers Trust Scotland and the National Carers Organisation. And the issue was also raised by the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland. The current carers allowance can only be claimed in respect of one person. So that means that someone who cares for more than one person isn't recognised for the additional care they provide. People with multiple caring roles are also significantly less likely to be able to take up paid work, and they also incur extra costs looking after more than one person. And because of the 35-hour minimum care requirement, if you provide 20 hours of care for one person and 15 for another, or perhaps uh, you know, various arrangements that add up to more than that 35 hours, that is disregarded if it's not for only one person. So people who need support miss out on it, um, as the hours requirement only recognises one cared for person. So these are perhaps natural outcomes of the fact that carers allowance is official, officially an income replacement benefit, rather than this being a deliberate attempt to not recognise additional caring responsibility. But nonetheless, with carers' assistance, we are going right back to the drawing board and we can build in recognition of the fact that 
people who care for more than one person require additional support. And research from SPICE suggests that in 2018-19, around 15% of carers' allowance recipients in Scotland will be caring for more than one person. That's around 12,000 people who provide extra care but don't receive any recognition for it. Now, I appreciate that the government already recognised this issue, having pledged to pay a supplement to carers caring for more than one disabled child, and I'm sure we all agree that's really welcome, but I do think we need to go further, and the amendments 176 and 183 take us in that direction. Amendment 176 ensures that any regulations setting an hours requirement will need to take into account hours spent caring for a second person or more people. And Amendment 181 is intended to make clear that higher or additional payments can be made to people with additional caring responsibilities. Now, I appreciate that no rules have yet been decided on eligibility. Um, eligibility rules are value for carers' assistance, and the details of how carers' assistance will work will rightly be laid out in regulation. And I don't want to preempt any process of consultation, but I do believe this is an important enough issue and has been raised with us enough times by the relevant groups that we should make it absolutely clear now that the regulations can be drawn to reflect a situation where the carer provides care for more than one person and to ensure that when the time comes to, to set up carers' assistance, the issue that I and many carers' groups and individuals have raised is given due consideration. Um, I know the Minister shares broad intention of these amendments, and I'm willing to listen to any concerns she might have around the wording and any suggestions she might offer around working together at stage three to ensure this issue is addressed. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if Ms Johnson for procedure would move Amendment 173 and withdraw after the debate. Move. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, can I invite other members to speak to the group? Um, Ms Maguire. Thank you, convener. Um, my understanding um, is that the bill allows for all the flexibilities that Alison Johnston is looking for in terms of caring for multiple people. Um, perhaps the, the minister could, or Alison Johnston could clarify that. If, um, we're getting carers' assistance regs will come here, and I think it would be quite important to look at the whole package that we offer for carers, um, and as, as well as gathering more evidence. I know that, that, that you know we have had information from carers' organisations, but I just feel that it would be good to do it in, uh, in the round at that point. Thank you. Um, could I invite the Minister to speak to the group? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I'm grateful to Ms Johnson for withdrawing uh, the amendments. We've had some interesting insights into the legal mind and world this morning. Um, and I want to turn to what is a substantive amendment, Amendment 176, um, which, as uh, Ms Johnson said, uh, would put a requirement uh, on the government to base any calculation of eligible hours for carers' assistance on the total number of hours spent caring uh, for multiple people. I do fully appreciate the point that Ms Johnson is making and that many of Scotland's carers are splitting their hours of care between more than one person and may be missing out on support despite significant caring responsibilities. I'm also sympathetic to the principle behind the amendment that we should recognise a wider range of caring situations and ensure that we're providing support to those who need it. I want to ensure we fully support carers, just as I know Ms Johnson does. She has uh, always been an effective champion for carers and indeed persuaded this government to introduce a young carers allowance. If assurance is being sought that the bill as drafted provides the powers for changes to be made in the number of hours of care required, for carers' assistance to be varied based on the number of people being cared for, or for hours to be aggregated, then I'm happy to give Ms Johnson and this committee that assurance. But there are many potential improvements to be made to carers' support, and I believe that in order to do that, we should do that together through the development, and, uh, the development of and consultation on carers' assistance regulations, which will be brought forward following passage of the bill. We've already made it clear our commitment to go designing these regulations with organisations, uh, relevant organisations and partners, 
and to allowing for any changes proposed to be consulted on with the public considered by this committee. And importantly, we would also consult with the Carer Benefit Advisory Group and the Independent Disability and Carer Benefits Expert Advisory Group, as well, of course, as a future Scottish Commission. I believe that th that approach ensures that changes to carers' consistent assistance are made in a robust and coherent way uh, and take into account what uh, priorities uh, should be. So I would ask Ms Johnson not to press this amendment, invite her instead to take part in the discussions with me as we develop carers' assistance regulations. Uh, I valued her opinion in the past and would very much welcome her advice again as we take forward this work. Thank you, Minister. Can I invite Ms Johnson to wind up and to press or withdraw the amendment? Um, Thank you. I appreciate the Minister's comments. In, in response to Ms Maguire, um, I agree the Bill does allow you know, such actions, but I'm actually seeking a requirement on, on, the, on the Parliament, on the Government. However, taking into account what the Minister has said, um, I would like to reflect further on that. Um, I will reserve the right to bring back an amendment at Stage 3, but I will not push these amendments today. I will not move them today. Thank you. Um, uh, are the committee content that um, Amendment 173 be withdrawn? Thank you. Um, the question is that sections 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yep. Thank you. Um, I call Amendment 174 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 173, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move? Not move. Uh, I call Amendment 175 in the name of Ms Johnson, already debated with Amendment 173, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move? Not move. Okay. I call Amendment 176 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with Amendment 173, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move? Not move. And I call Amendment 177 in the name of Ms Johnson, already debated with 173, and ask Alison Johnson to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. I call Amendment 178 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move. Not move. And I call Amendment 165 in the name of Jerry. 65. 65. Sorry, Amendment 65 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 64, and ask Mr Balfour to move or not move Amendment 65. Sorry, can we just keep checking? Um, not moved. Not moved, sorry. Thank you. And I call Amendment 179 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. And I call Amendment 180 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move. Not move. And I call Amendment 181 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated, and ask Alison Johnson to move or not move. Not move. Um, we now move to a, a new grouping um, in form of assistance and I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister, group with amendments as says it's shown in the groupings, I don't have the list. It's just because there's so, so many of them. All right, um, uh, the groupings are available on the, the groupings list. Um, Minister, to move Amendment 20 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, convener. Uh, I'm pleased to move these amendments in my name. Our policy intention uh, has been clear from the outset, and that is to ensure an individual has the right to choose the form in which they receive their assistance. Uh, and we have never suggested that payment in forms other than money would be imposed. Provision for assistance in kind is already included in the bill to allow Scottish ministers flexibility to explore options for other forms of assistance that might be offered as an alternative to money where this may be appropriate. However, in response to concerns raised by a number of stakeholders during stage one, I am bringing forward amendments 20 to 32 to make policy intent clear. They set out that an individual must agree to receive payment of their assistance in a form other than money. In addition, they also make clear that an individual has the right to withdraw agreement if they are receiving assistance in kind and revert to receiving money. These amendments also provide that ministers cannot make deductions from someone's assistance in order to recover an, over, an overpayment unless the individual either agrees to that or has refused to agree to a repayment plan unreasonably. 
This, too, gives legal expression to a policy commitment the Government has made from the beginning, which is that we should always, in the first instance, try to agree a mutually acceptable repayment plan with an individual where there has been an overpayment that, that falls to be recovered. Um, turning to Mr Griffin's amendments, um, I have to say that I don't understand the point of those amendments. They do not appear to change the legal effect of my amendments uh, and they, in my view, don't represent good lawmaking, so I cannot support Mr Griffin's amendments. In every case, his A amendments state that regulations must provide for assistance to be given in the form of money unless they don't. I, I don't see the point of that proposition. Obviously, if the regulations do not provide for assistance to be given in a form other than money, the assistance has to be given in the form of money. His B amendments unnecessarily complicate the text. My amendments state that assistance can only be given in a non-monetary form if the individual has agreed to that. Mr Griffin's amendments add a further statement that before agreeing to receive non-monetary assistance, the individual has to be first offered assistance in the monetary form. I'm not at all sure that his amendments are technically going to the right points of my amendments. But more importantly, I don't understand the apparent assistance that the offer of one form of assistance should be made before the offer of another. If we are asking someone to choose between money and, uh, for example, uh, uh, other forms of assistance, we should be presenting the person with both, both options at the same time so that they can choose between them. If the concern is that people will somehow be led into taking assistance in a non-monetary form without understanding they have a choice, um, I think that that uh, indicates that there is a, a lack of understanding of uh, the basic principles that in Scots law, agreement requires an offer and acceptance. Uh, so in summary, uh, convener, I, I don't believe that Mr Griffin's amendments uh, add anything in legal terms or in deliverability to the amendments I've brought forward and would urge the committee not to accept these. Um, and I move the amendments in my name. Thank you. I invite Mr Griffin to move and speak to Amendment 20A and the other amendments in the group. Thanks, Kavina. Um, I will be supporting the, the amendments in the name of the Minister and the amendments in my name are simply probing amendments that I will not um, be pressing. Um, these were lodged on the, um, off the back of concerns by outside organisations, Shell Poverty Action Group and INIB, uh, Citizens Advice Scotland, Inclu Inclusion Scotland, um, amongst others, and it related to the concern that the Minister set out that um, there was a, the potential that people could be led down a, a particular course of action and, and, agreeing, and agreeing to accept a non-monetary form of assistance. And the, the, the amendments worded as they were, were that uh, an applicant were to be offered assistance in money and without and the alternative to make clear that it was their right to accept that or not before then starting a discussion on alternative payments. But um, I accept the, the Minister's um, reason for um, not accepting these and we will perhaps um, enter into discussion with the Minister as to how, to we, how we best um, reflect the ambition of the organisations that have, have relayed the concerns to me. Um, does anyone else wish to speak to the group? No. Um, can I invite the Minister to wind up? If she uh, can I in winding up, um, convener, can I simply um, thank Mr Griffin for his withdrawal of his amendments? I think the amendments in my name now give us a robust position in which to move forward. Thank you. Okay. And for procedure, Mr Griffin, could you move 20 and seek to withdraw it for the committee? Thanks. Okay. Move 20 and then seek to withdraw. Uh, the committee can find that 20 has been withdrawn. Thank yes. you. Um, I call Amendment 20B in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mr Griffin to move or not move. Move. Thank you. Um, I call Amendment 20C in the name of Mark Griffin, already debated with Amendment 20, and ask Mark Griffin to move or not move. Not move. I uh, ask the Minister to press or withdraw Amendment 20. Uh, to press. Thank you. Question is that Amendment 20 be agreed, are we all agreed? Thank you. Um, I, I'm moving um, to um, a fine. 
possible a final group for today. Um, it's a group on terminal illness, and I call Amendment 182, the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with Amendment 67, 68, 69, 189, 191 and 192, and ask Mr Griffin to move Amendment 182 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Camilla. I move Amendment um, 182 in my name. Um, we will be supporting Jeremy Balfour's Amendment 67 and 68, backed by MD Scotland and Mary Curie, um, but we wouldn't be supporting um, Amendment 69 in Jeremy Balfour's name. Um, the current system uses a, a definition of the last six months of life, which means uh, currently far too many people diagnosed with a, a terminal illness don't get the support they need quickly enough or have to go through a face-to-face -face, um, assessment. Um, the, the outside evidence that I have received is that uh, clinicians simply don't feel confident enough to make a prediction that a, a person is within the last six months of life for a range of conditions, and, and particularly motor neuron disease um, clinicians aren't, don't feel that they have the, the, the appropriate information to, to predict a, a, a disease trajectory, to be able to predict um, that someone would be in the last um, six months of life and then allow them to, to access the, the fast-tracked um, benefits. At, at present, only those with terminal cancer diagnosis are receiving benefits in that way, and we feel that expanding the definition um, to the last two years of life, as proposed, will allow more conditions um, such as MND, heart failure and COPD to, to qualify. Amendments 182, 189, 191, 192 in my name complement those of Jeremy's which um, we will be supporting. They seek to establish, um, as exists under the current system, special rules for those qualifying for Social Security which includes a fast-track process, a less intrusive assessment process, a higher rate and more flexible um, payments. Um, at present, there is nothing on the face of the bill which will allow for such a system, and these amendments would allow for that system with the details to be set out in regulations. With all that said, though, I appreciate the course of action the Minister has um, undertaken and, uh, and the, the lack of formal consultation that has um, been undertaken on this particular issue. Um, while it was an issue that we flagged in our uh, Stage 1 report that we felt um, had to be addressed, um, I would be happy to work with the Government at the conclusion of that um, consulta consultation stage, along with um, MND Scotland, Marie Curie and other organisations who have been rightly lobbying hard um, for a, a, a change to the, the definition of um, terminal ill from the, the six months to, to a, a clearer definition that would al allow those um, people who have terminal diagnoses to benefit from um, some of the changes that we'd like to see and to avoid the situation that we've seen currently where um, there have been occasions where people have, have died before they actually uh, received the, be the benefits that they're entitled to. So I will not be pressing the amendments in my name um, following the, the Minister's letter. Thank you. Um, can I invite Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 67 and the other amendments in the group? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Commissioner. I, I move Amendment 67 uh, in my name. I, I think this bill, and hopefully Act, is there to protect the most vulnerable in our society. And there can be nobody more vulnerable when we go to a hospital and are told that they are going to have a, ter or they have a terminal illness. I think all of us have had friends or family who have gone through that experience. And it is a devastating experience to go through, and one I'm sure none of us hope to go through ourselves. What I seek to do is not to change any of the regulations or rules in regard to what happens at the moment. All I seek to do is extend the definition of terminal illness from six months to two years. Now, as I said slightly sarcastically during the evidence, we are all terminally ill. 
And at some point, we have to make a judgment call as to where that number goes. And I do also welcome um, the letters that we received from the minister this morning in regard to going out to consult with medical professionals and individuals. However, I'm still going to press this because I do believe that we want to indicate at this stage that I personally don't believe, and I think, I hope the committee don't believe, that six months in, is appropriate in regard to where we are today. Now, we may come back and say 24 months isn't the right figure either, and once we have that evidence and when, once we've had that consultation discussion, I would be happy to work with all MSPs to find an appropriate figure. But clearly, things have moved on. Things do change in regard to um, illness, um, the way that doctors can do their work and predict that. And I do believe that at this stage to say we're going to move to a two-year uh, figure is indicating where we want to go and is helpful. And I believe it, it will give greater security uh, to people who have, been, have this terminal illness um, hanging over them. Um, I think it is important to point out that there are, have been quite a number of cases, and I appreciate the system is going to be different and things will be different under how we go forward, but people do apply and end up not getting the money before they die. And that seems to me to miss the whole point of having benefits, is that it's there to help you with the illness or disability that you have. Can I move briefly in some way to Amendment 69, which I think probably unhelpfully has been picked up by some MSPs um, who are not part of this committee and has not been read as a whole. I will not be moving Amendment 69 in my name today, but I do think at some point within regulations or if this is approved that we do need to look at it again. The, the reason I do that is that some people, very gratefully, although they get a terminal, di terminal ill diagnosis, due to medicine, due to science, due to whatever reason, do survive way beyond the three years. I think I give the indication to committee that when I was sitting as a tribunal member, somebody came to us who had been on <clears throat> high rate care, high rate mobility for nearly 25 years having been gone through the terminal illness and had survived that and was living a very normal life thanks to medication that he was on. And that wasn't the individual's fault. Nothing had changed in his circumstances and the department had missed it. So the reason for that was not in any way to try to intervene on someone who is close to death, but it is to make sure that the benefits are going in the right way to the right people. But I, I accept that perhaps, again, the wording is not exactly how it should be, and so I will withdraw Amendment 69. I do think it is important, though, that we have had lobbying letters and from different groups saying that six months is simply too short a period. And I do accept, even with, uh, out within the third sector, there are, there are different views on that time number. But I think 24 months... Um, for me at the moment, and I'm wait, happy to see the evidence in due course, is the right one. And I think it gives a very strong message if we allow this to go through today, if we pass this today, to say to people, we understand what you're going through and we want the benefits to help you while you are alive, not once you have gone. Thank you, Mr. Balfour. Does anyone else wish to come in? Uh, Mr. Adam, Mr. Um, first, I'm very conscious of time. But I will try and get you both in. Thank you. I, in this issue, I really, what I would want to be known uh, information from clinicians exactly where they stand on this whole scenario as well, because uh, I think uh, w the evidence we took, we've not actually had something from the clinicians telling us exactly where we stand on this. But one of the bigger concerns I have is with, uh, and I know uh, Mr. Balfour isn't pressing it today, is 69, is the fact that, you know, this arbitrary way of looking at terminal illness, 
You know, if by the grace of God or luck, uh, someone's still there or going into remission after a two-year pay uh, position, I, I really don't think we can actually start there and making judgments at that stage. You know, people can go into remission with long-term conditions. People can be OK, but they still could end up with a terminal condition. And I'm, I'm a bit concerned where we're going. I do appreciate that he's already said that he's not going to press that, but I do have some serious concerns with regards to that issue in itself. But on the other part, uh, I think we really need to uh, get more information and get more kind of really Get, get everything right in this one again, because if we don't, we could be uh, leaving things open. Okay, thank you. Mr McPherson. Thank, thank you, Convener. I'll be as succinct as possible. I, I commend both members for bringing these sets of uh, amendments forward. I think this, this is extremely important. I've also been in correspondence with Marie Curie on this issue and um, in private correspondence with, with the government. I absolutely welcome Mark Griffin's decision not to, to press his amendments. I think the issue of fast-tracking is fundamentally important, and I, I warmly welcome the, the fact that you want to work with the government to get it absolutely right so that we deliver fast-tracking for those who need it, and I urge the government to engage as constructively as possible with, with Mark Griffin to get that absolutely right. On uh, the general point around the definition of terminal illness, I... Uh, appreciate Mr Balfour's withdrawing of a number of amendments. I would also urge withdrawal of the remaining amendments because I think we have put out the, the, the minister has written to clinicians, let's gather that evidence and let's get this absolutely right. I would hate for uh, such, uh, Mr Balfour's proposal to, to fall at this stage and, uh, and us not to have the chance to, 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 to approach this at stage three. Let's all work together and get this right at stage three. Ms McNeill in first and then Ms Jones. I'll try and shorten what I was going to say. I think it's unfortunate this group is going to be split by the, the need to finish up. But anyway, um, first of all, I mean, I, I, I'm supportive of Jeremy Balfour's um, suggestion that we should indicate the general direction that we want to head in. And I, I would like to think, well, it's obviously a matter for the committee, I would like to think that um, when we've heard from the consultation that ministers are conducting to get some uh, feedback from the medical profession, that there will be hopefully some consensus around where, where we would end up in that. I'm certainly of the view, having spoken to the organisations that have been mentioned already, that the six month um, is, is far, far too short of where we'd want to be. Um, and I just wanted to finally add that uh, I'm pleased that Jeremy is withdrawing Amendment 69. I don't know what the answer to that question is. There will be cases where people live way beyond their expectations. It's something we may just have to accept. But what I'm absolutely against is the idea that we should that the agency must review after three years. Um, perhaps if the agency had, if there was some discretion, that might solve it. But I think. Um, it's vitally important that we allow, uh, that we don't head down in, in this direction of, of that prescriptive period of time and making that an absolute obligation on on the agency. Okay, uh, Ms. Johnson. Um, thank you. I'd like to congratulate um, both Mark Griffin and Jeremy Balfour from, for bringing forward these amendments because th this is a hugely important issue. Um, from what I've heard today and uh, the action that the minister is taking. I, I'm, I'd like to make it clear that I am, I absolutely, I wholeheartedly agree that six months is entirely inappropriate and we absolutely have to look at that. Um, but Mr. Balfour said that there's a judgment call on what number we use when referring to the two years. And I'm just wondering if that is the best approach in this instance. Um, I can see clearly, and I'm sure Mr. Balfour does too, the benefits of consulting with a range of learned, experienced professionals on this to ensure that we get the right outcome. If taking time discussing this with the government means that you could bring back a better proposal, um, perhaps one that, you know, that, that there's no requirement to consider whether the patient, uh, you know, no requirement around that issue of time. It may be that you're constraining and limiting options here that could be better explored with these groups. Um, so yes, I'm finding this 
issue rather difficult, but I would like the minister, when the minister is speaking, to, ins to, to give absolute clarity and assurance that anything the government might bring at stage three will be at the very minimum as strong as what Mr Balfour is suggesting. I mean, I'm talking to 67 and 68. I wholeheartedly agree that 69 should not be moved. But, you know, can the minister um, confirm that anything the government brings forward at stage three would not weaken what Mr Balfour is suggesting, but would build on that? And perhaps Mr Balfour could, could suggest whether or not he feels that it would be worthwhile taking advantage of the expertise and offer to bring back a strengthened proposal working with the government at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite the minister to speak to the group? Thank you very much. Um, can I start by welcoming uh, Mr Griffin's uh, move not to uh, press his amendments. I'm grateful to him for that. Um, I'm very happy to work with him in terms of ensuring that we have <clears throat> uh, a clear proposition uh, in terms of fast tracking, uh, which as a minimum uh, replicates the current special rules uh, in terms of how we fast track individuals who have a diagnosis of terminal illness. Um, with respect to Mr Balfour's amendments, I would ask uh, him not to press any of his amendments. I'm grateful to him for uh, not pressing Amendment 69. I think that is the right uh, course of action. This is a very difficult question, as Ms McNeill uh, uh, indicated in her contribution, to uh, work out exactly what, in all fairness, could be done in a circumstance uh, where an individual has a diagnosis of terminal illness but, be, but lives fortunately and happily beyond the expectation uh, of that diagnosis. And I, I am unsure whether indeed anything should be done in those circumstances. I think it is a very difficult question for us to deal with. I, I cannot give um, Ms Johnson the assurance that she seeks precisely because I think it is important to hear the view of our clinical, medical and health professionals, which is why I have written to them in the way that I have. Not only are they charged with uh, determining whether uh, an illness is terminal, um, they are, will also be responsible in many respects for the deliverability of uh, what we do here. And I think uh, it would be wrong of me, just as I think it is wrong uh, in terms of Mr Balfour's uh, amendments, for me or this committee to uh, presume what that clinical community is likely to say on what is a complex and difficult matter in advance of them having the opportunity to say it. And that is why, in my opinion, uh, we should uh, not press these amendments. If they are pressed, uh, I would hope the committee will oppose them so that we can have the benefit collectively of uh, that community's uh, um, professional and expert opinion to help us reach a view on how we might define terminal illness already with my commitment uh, in terms of how we will take forward fast tracking. There is no consensus in the stakeholder community. I think it is important to state that. That is an indication of the complexity and the difficulties around this matter. Um, but at the end of the day, any definition on ter of terminal illness that the agency works from is a definition that the clinical and health community will have to be comfortable with, believe is deliverable, and is deliverable in a fair and consistent manner across the country. And for that reason, I would ask Mr Balfour not to press any of his amendments, uh, but to work with us and the committee to work with us. I will, of course, share the opinion that I receive as a result of the consultation with the committee. Uh, and uh, as I've said, I'm grateful to Mr Griffin for not pressing his. If Mr Balfour does press, then I would ask the committee to oppose them. OK, um, uh, can I move to Mr Griffin and ask him to formally move 182 and seek to withdraw it from the committee? Thank you, Camilla. I formally move 182 and, and seeking to withdraw. Acknowledge that it seems all members of the committee and the government um, are in agreement that um, a change would be desirable um, and more than happy to work with the government and the professionals that she's consulted with and the external stakeholders um, who have put forward evidence to the committee to um, reach a, a mutually agreeable way forward. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Can, content that that be withdrawn? Yes. Thank you. Um, can I call Amendment 21 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 20. 
Moved. Uh, question is that amendment 21 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Uh, call amendment 183 in the name of Alison Johnson, already debated with amendment 173, and ask Ms Johnson to move or not move. Not move. Thank you. Uh, the question is uh, not moved. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the question is that schedule one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And the question is that section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes. That's um, very helpful. I know we've run one, but thank you very much to the committee for their perseverance. We will um, continue uh, after recess, and a new marshalled list will be. Um, issued um, I'll, I'll work on Monday and uh, look to see everyone well refreshed after recess. Thank you very much for your attendance this morning.